Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today um, for the Lifecycle Institute's Impact Webinar. Today's webinar is Training Speeds Continuous Improvement. Before we get started, if you have any questions for the presenter about the topic, you can use the chat window located in the bottom right corner of your screen to type in your questions. Make sure you select all participants so everyone else can see what you're asking. If you have any technical questions or difficulties, you can also use that same chat window and send your message directly to the Lifecycle Institute, and that way we can address your question or concern. Today we have a special treat for you because we have two presenters. Tara Denton is a learning subject matter expert, and Joe Mikes is a senior consultant focused on leading clients through business process improvements. They've coupled today to bring their different perspectives, and they also wrote an article about the importance of a planned approach to training in support of a major business change. And now, Joe, can you tell me why you and Tara decided to partner to write this article and to do this webinar about the challenges of change and how training affects the results of a change initiative? Yeah, thanks, Sherry. You know, over several years of leading clients through changes, my approach to training these changes has not been as consistent as I would have liked and it's caused second and third efforts on the same subject. In an effort to improve this, I realized LCE teaches many higher education classes here in Charleston. So I went to the Life Cycle Institute group and asked them to work with me on improving the approach to training for our projects. Tara Denton's one of the resident subject matter experts on developing and delivering high quality training and with her expertise, we've developed an approach that solved those inconsistencies of the past. Great, thank you. Regarding the challenges of change, my role as a senior consultant with LCE is the on-site project manager. I've had the opportunity to work with over 50 clients, which crossed over 40 industries. They've included union and non-union shops, as well as both product and service type businesses. During a few of the engagements, I've seen clients fail to hold the challenges in place, and after working after working with clients for 12 to 18 months, it's very frustrating to hear the work has unraveled. <clears throat> so what we're going to show you here today applies to many types of large changes, software change, process reengineering, lean initiatives, leadership changes, uh, startup of a new product line, all of these types of changes apply. You know, the type of change can vary. They all require employees to do things differently. It's all too common for me to hear that some change the client went through in the past didn't last, or just as bad, they're now performing their duties twice because they're unable to let go of the old way for some reason. Changing employees' daily lives is challenging. The technical change and the cultural change both need to be addressed to be successful. Most organizations are effective at the technical stuff, the software installation, the equipment commissioning, engineering a product line, those kinds of things. On the other hand, most organizations are not that effective at the cultural side of change, and LCE recognizes this and spends a significant amount of time developing and managing the change management aspects, which includes training. The change management strategy includes assessing the organization for the change capabilities, using a risk plan, using a communication plan, defining a shared vision, developing these detailed tasks for employees to follow with clear lines of accountability. When all these things are in place, effective training for the employees on the changes, followed by a follow-up plan that works as required. Today's lesson is on effective training and this follow-up. Next, we'd like to get some feedback from everyone attending today on your experience with company training. Joe, thank you for that introduction and um, for the explanation of why we're working together. Looks like we have the poll open now. For everyone listening, think of a recent change at your organization and what role did training play in that change? Was it a major consideration at the very kickoff of the project, a consideration during the initial rollout, or was it not a major consideration at all? We'll just take a few more minutes for that. And it looks like our results are going to be coming in soon. Yeah, those results should be up in just a second, Tara. 
I'm looking at it, and we'll see this here in a minute. It looks like it's about half, half and half between A and B, but we'll get those get those out pretty soon, and we'll show those. And Joe can speak to those as he discusses some observations uh, from the field that also played a part in deciding what kind of approach we as lifecycle can uh, take to the training process when we're on site. Thanks, Tara. You know, a smart training approach is key to help the employees transition from current state to where they need to be. There are two big advantages for doing this. First, it educates employees on specific tasks and how to do them consistently, which is directly related to standard work. A lot of people are familiar with that. And the second major advantage is that the training materials stay behind as the legacy documentation that will train future employees. I was recently in a call with one of our past clients, LCE Workwith in Louisiana, and they said the biggest change for them was the culture change. They said that since LCE's finish date, we've promoted or moved almost 100% of the supervisors and the processes are still as strong as ever. Everyone who came up in the ranks went through the same training and we all do business one way. We're proud of them for following the plan and also considered that as one of the highest compliments LCE could have received for all the training efforts. Effective training is essential to long-term success and reduced operating costs. To illustrate this process, Tara will walk us through the building blocks of effective training. Thank you, Mike and Joe, <laughs> Joe Mikes, and again, um, thanks for the insight on the background of the training approach. I just realized from one of our from one of our technical support members that it looks like we didn't have the right poll come up first, but don't worry, that poll is going to make sense in just a little while. So you got your first exposure to it a little early. As Joe stated, to help people through the change and sustain those changes, a structured change management process and a well-planned planned training approach should be included. While working on the approach, some questions we considered were, how will we make people aware of their new responsibilities and how they fit in with those of the rest of the organization? What type of approach can ensure that the training is directly related to the specific changes each stakeholder group will need to embrace? To help clients transition from the current state to the final desired state of performance, we incorporated best practices in training. Our approach includes summarizing the technical process changes based on role responsibility, developing learning objectives that are active, specific, and measurable, creating training plans based on those learning objectives which are focused and meaningful, and providing follow-up coaching after the training and program evaluation. To illustrate the process, let's take you through a case study where an individual actually experiences the process. Meet Janet. Janet remembered this morning that she had three hours of training to attend. She wanted to crawl under a rock and avoid the dreaded training. Unfortunately, training credits aren't given to those hiding under a rock. As Janet considered what her day had in store, she recalled how many things have changed since she was hired. Janet had been with the company seven years. In that time, she experienced big changes at the company, namely a new CEO and two new software systems that were supposed to help them do their jobs. For the first system change, the software vendor provided some training to go with the system improvements, but when the functional training was over, the employees were left to their own devices to make the new system work with their current processes. Nine months later, pieces of the old system were still used to make sure the information and reports were correct and that the new CEO got the quality data he needed. As Janet saw it, the problem started quite early. Today's training marks the start of the second software system change. What is in store for Janet? Well, now you're going to get to take another look at that poll that we introduced a little early, and you are going to be able to choose what kind of experience Janet has in her training. Please vote on option A or option B to determine what happens with Janet's training. Select one of the options and we'll discuss the corresponding outcome. If you're having trouble answering the poll, you can also decide to give us an annotation on the screen. For example, a check mark beside A or B. Either way, your vote will count.
So some are selecting option A and some are selecting option B. Which will we look at first? So far, we have 28 uh, selected option A and 72 selected option B. Well, since we did have some votes for option A, let's go ahead and explain what happened with option A. In option A, this is the outcome. Janet and the rest of her team think they have an awareness of the kinds of transactions they will have in the system, but they know they'll just have to figure out most of it when they actually have the system on their computers and can try the transaction themselves. After 10 minutes of the training, Janet's fears were confirmed. Nothing different was going to happen with this round of training. They would secretly use the old and new system simultaneously until they could actually use the new system, practice on the new system, and trust the new system. Janet began thinking about her grocery list and what she would like for dinner that evening. The instructor of the training actually released people early from the training because there were no questions to answer. If you chose option A, you get a do-over. Now we'll move to option B. For those of you that chose option B, this time the organization takes a training approach based on how people learn by defining clear objectives the training should reach, which are aligned with how learners are supposed to perform on the job. This time, Janet is told why she is in class with a few simple objectives to learn. The time estimates per section are listed and there are no sections over 30 minutes. The trainers illustrate to her how her work fits in with other people's jobs. For Janet, this part of the program provided the big picture of how everyone's work is linked together and what exactly will change. Ten minutes into the session, Janet was beginning to practice her role. As soon as she is comfortable with that first role, the class moved to the next task, continuing until Janet is introduced to all of the changes her job will encounter. Let's return to the story to complete Janet's experience and our case study. Before she knew it, the three hours of training were over and Janet was clear on what she needed to do. The class materials included job aids to help Janet remember the steps of her task. Before leaving the class, the facilitators discussed a coaching process that would begin immediately. During the coaching process, coaches would visit Janet's work area daily, then weekly, then monthly, until coaching was no longer needed. The facilitators told Janet and the other learners that the coach's purpose is to provide additional support and to ask how they can help her perform the job tasks or improve the job. Janet received a copy of the questions so she knew exactly what to expect. Janet walked out of the training session energized. She had been given a lot to process, but it wasn't overwhelming because she practiced scenarios in training that were true to her daily duties. She was especially happy to have the coaching group listen to her and resolve issues for the next few weeks. But what happens after the training? Let's fast forward to see if Janet's company was able to sustain the changes introduced. Ten weeks after the training, Janet and her colleagues are pleased with how things are going. There's a commitment from management to fix problems along the way. Overall, the committee has resolved about 250 issues, big and small. The big difference for Janet this time was the well-planned training, real-life examples with practice in the classroom, and the follow-up coaching plan. Everyone has settled into their new roles faster than when changes occurred in the past. This time, there is no going back to the old way. Janet's story incorporated a, planning train, a planned training approach to new processes. In her story, the training was based on the actual new duties that, the, that uh, changes required of employees. Learning objectives were introduced at the beginning of training, so Janet knew why she was attending training and what she was expected to learn relevant to her job. The training was active. That was a big difference between option A and B in our poll incorporated practice of the actual skills and had review sessions to maximize learning. And the training had a defined follow-up coaching plan so that Janet and her team could access on-the-job support. Now that we've had the case study for an illustration of the process, let's get more specific and describe each step in this process. 
Step one is summarize the process changes. Business changes to process are frequently captured in documents like the one shown on this slide, flow charts on the left of the slide, and responsibility matrices on the right of the slide. From these documents, summarize the process duties for the role listed as responsible in the process. That's the person that actually does the role. Process duties are our tasks that an employee must carry out to perform the process, and they may encompass several steps as defined in this responsibility matrix. The process duties are then documented on a training worksheet that will provide future documentation for the approach. Step two is develop learning objectives. Learning objectives are statements that define the behavior training define the behavior change expected after the training. Learning objectives should be specific and measurable so that it is clear if learning is if the learning has achieved the desired knowledge and skill. Those learning obje objectives tell us what the learner is going to do differently after the training. There are techniques to develop strong learning objectives like A, B, C, D, which is audience, behavior, condition, degree, and SMART. Many of you might have heard of SMART specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. This slide shows several learning objectives that are based on Bloom's taxonomy, which is a model that helps guide learning objective development by using verbs that define the depth of learning necessary to achieve the behavior changes expected after training. Once we have determined the learning objectives, we can now draft our actual training plan to train on the new processes. For each learning objective, determine a piece of content and a piece of participation that would achieve the learning objective. Participation is necessary to improve retention. The learning objectives play a big role in helping to determine those participatory moments. For example, if the learning objective begins with a verb, discuss, the learner should engage in a discussion. If the learning objective begins with the word demonstrate, then the class, then in the class the learners practice, demonstrate, or show whatever task is being asked of them. Step four, review, follow up, and evaluation. Once the participatory moments are defined, include a review method to ensure objectives were met. Depending on the level of learning and performance you wish to achieve, which is again determined by the learning objectives, you can have a variety of different review or confirmation of learning techniques. This step transitions us from the actual learning engagement or the assimilation phase of learning into the application phase and follow-through phases of learning. The follow-through phase is the sustainment piece of the puzzle. Follow-up and evaluation are necessary to understand how learners use the new knowledge and skills on the job and define the benefits the new behaviors can bring to the organization. And with that, I'll pass the mic back to Joe to talk with us about coaching cards. Thanks, Tara. <clears throat> In addition to the follow-up steps or review steps we just talked about where there will be some discussion or testing of the training material, the ongoing steps of what we call the coaching card process, I want to take a minute to explain that because a lot of people aren't that familiar with it. The process is especially effective for sustaining new processes recently put in place. The coaching card is a one-page questionnaire regarding how well the job's going. There are questions about the activities, the reports, and the desired results. The intent is to uncover issues the employees are facing to conduct their part of the business. It should be used immediately after training for about 12 weeks and continued over the long term on a monthly and then quarterly basis. This is a great tool to leave with senior management to make sure the new processes do not unravel. When done correctly, these cards will indicate when an issue begins to surface before it becomes a big problem. For the 12-week period, the implementation team stays together to resolve the issues that come up. In summary, training plans based on learning objectives assure all the important information is communicated. Second, the learning objectives provide focus to the training sessions 
so there is no wasted time for the employees. Coaching card questions should also be aligned with the learning objectives. They all tie together to assure accurate and meaningful training occurs. Now that we've covered all this, I'd like Tara to go over the basics one more time. Tara, back to you. Thank you, Joe. And thanks for linking those steps together to make them clear how all of this process eventually comes together in the end. In this webinar, we discussed an approach to move from training as an afterthought to treating it as the primary method to build a sustainable, viral method to penetrate the organization and promote ownership of new business process improvements, processes, and behaviors. So to review the four-step process to train and sustain the change, summarize the technical process changes based on role responsibility, use process documentation to support this step, Develop learning objectives that are active, specific, and measurable. Create training plans based on those learning objectives. Make the plans focused and meaningful by, incorporated elements, by incorporating elements of content participation or some way of interacting with the material. And then provide follow-up coaching after training and program evaluation to ensure on-the-job support and sustainment. So Sherry, I'd like to pass the mic to you to monitor questions and wrap up today's session. All right, thanks, Tara. Uh, we do have some upcoming events um, taking place in the next month or so I wanted to tell you guys about. Um, one of the things that we have coming up um, very recently is going to be a workshop on reliability and operations excellence by Ron Moore. That's going to be here at our Charleston office September 13th and 14th. It is almost full. We have um, literally just a few spaces left. So if you're interested in doing that two-day workshop with Ron Moore, um, definitely email us or give us a call as soon as possible. Uh, we also have a maintenance planning and scheduling class coming up at the end of September predictive maintenance technologies at the end of September, and then at the beginning of October, we've got a class um, that we just started teaching this year, um, shutdowns, turnarounds, and outages. Um, so that one is almost full as well. Um, so definitely um, let us know as soon as possible if you'd like to register for any of those. We'd be more than happy to accommodate you. And uh, we do um, have a great announcement, too, about our new office in Houston. Uh, we did open up an office there, and we will start teaching classes there in November. So we do have um, the Reliability Excellence Application class in November in Houston, and then we also have Maintenance Planning and Scheduling coming up next year and Root Cause Analysis. So if you're located closer to that area than you are to our home office here in Charleston, um, check those out and um, go ahead and get yourself registered. And we will um, go ahead and take some questions now. So if you do have some questions, um, feel free to send those in to the chat window. Um, and we do have one that just popped up here. Um, and this one is, um, how long after training should the follow-up be performed? Does it depend on the follow-up method that's chosen? Well, Joe, I think that speaks to the discussion we had on coaching cards. Um, yeah, I, I would recommend that we train as close to time that you can go live as possible, and preferably you train and and start the process. You know, the next shift or the next day people are working, and and begin that follow up process immediately. You do not have to go out if you're using this coaching card process. You don't have to go out there every single day and ask them the same questions, but frequent enough that uh, they're getting the problems addressed. So maybe once a week, once every other week. It also depends on how many people are in the role. If you have one person uh, filing claims, you're not going to want to sit with that person every Monday and ask them the same questions. But if you have 10 people filing claims, you can certainly talk to two a week or something and make sure you're you know, talking with all of them and getting their feedback. Absolutely, and Joe, I'd like to add on to that if I if I could. From a, a larger training uh, perspective or learning perspective, one thing that Joe mentioned is key. If uh, you are sending an individual to training or if you're attending training yourself, if you don't use that new knowledge within the first 30 days or so, the motivation to do so is drastically reduced. So the key is to actually have some reinforcement in the training and be able to practice those new knowledge and skills within 30 days and have some short-term goals that can be achieved within 90 days uh, by using that new knowledge and skills. When we do high-impact learning engagements, which is uh, a 
a grouping of training matched with a follow-through management program and on-the-job coaching, we actually have a web-based service that helps trainees log their 90-day goals and then helps track them throughout that nine-day process to see if those individuals are actually learning their new knowledge and skills through training and using them and helping to achieve goals um, via that training. Okay, thanks guys. Um, we do have another question that came through about the, um, the session recording. We will have that available um, to anyone who's registered for today's session, whether they attend it or not. Um, we will email out a link to this recording as well as a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. So yes, that will go out um, usually within a day or two. That will be in your inbox. We also wanted to mention that Joe and I, uh, Sherry mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, but we do have an article based on this topic that goes into a little bit uh, more detail. That can be found at the Lifecycle um, website, lc.com, in our resource library. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe has earlier written an article on coaching cards. It looks like we have a question about, do you have an example of a coaching card? And Joe, is there an example there in is. that white paper that you wrote? There is, yes. So if you search uh, for a coaching card article by Joe Mikes in our resource library on lce.com, you'll be able to find that example. All right, and um, it doesn't look like we have any additional questions. Um, and what we will do as well, um, just to make it easier on you, um, is to include a link to that coaching card's white paper um, in the email that we'll send out along with the recording. That's a great idea. Yeah, do it with both papers so they have it. Okay. Yeah. We can do that. Um, no last minute questions coming through, um, so we thank you all for attending today. If you do have any questions or um, want to contact Tara or Joe directly, um, feel free to send us an email at education at lce.com and we will respond to those promptly. Thank you so much and have a great afternoon.